But I'm just going to pray to open before I hand over to the band. You and um, reflecting on you and our relationship with you, God. And we just thank you that there are so many ways to be grateful for the, for the sunshine, for baby Ellis, for all the different things that you give us, Father. But we're also so aware of maybe the rush or um, the difficult things we've come t- uh, today from, Lord. And we just pray that this morning would be a place where we all meet individually with you for your spirit and presence. And we just thank you that uh, you want to meet with all of us and to deepen your relationship with us. When your enemy presses and hard, do not fear. And if anybody would like to be involved in making and taking some meals to Risa Maria in the next couple of weeks, then please see me or send me a message. Uh, you can find my number on the, the DCF WhatsApp and uh, we'll put together a, a little timetable. Um, so yeah, uh, today then we have our usual, all the kids stuff happening. There'll usually be a slide to say when uh, to take them out and follow the people in the green t-shirts down to our creche and junior church and youth church. And we have Ed speaking to us this morning, carrying on our series in 1 Thessalonians. A couple of events this week. It's um, Friends and Neighbours for those over 60 at half past two on Tuesday. So I'm going to hand over to Phil. I hope. Oh, there he is. I can see you. I thought I was going to have to suddenly make up a kid's look. Thanks. I know it's been a real, it's been a long while since you've been here. Back by popular request from Caddy and Jack. You hear the Mike Whitehouse doesn't like it. I wonder if you can actually put something, click on for me and we'll see. Can someone tell me what bird that is? Put their hand up and tell me. Yes, Oshan. It's a robin, that's right. That's right, it's like a red breast like you. That's good, yeah, that's robin. So these are going to get a little bit harder, but these are all the birds that I saw in my garden over the last couple of days. Apart from a macaw, that's right. Yeah, okay. So, next one. What have we got here then? This is a male bird. So, that's a little clue then. Dylan. It's not. Oh, yeah, it is a crow. <laughs> Good thing I turned around. I know I don't know my birds. I turned around. You are right. Dead on. I've got so many crows in my garden. I know they take all the seeds from all the other birds. That's fantastic. Okay, it's another clue there because there's another black bird coming up a little bit later. Oh, this one. Oh, they've been nesting in my trees. Rebecca. It's a magpie. That's right. I've been nesting in my trees. Make a lots of mess all over our patio chairs. That's right. And another one. What we got here? What else was in my garden the other day as well, James? Can you click that for me? Or has it stopped clicking? Uh, it, by the way, he's just trying to get the internet working at the same time, aren't you? So you're doing two jobs at once. So what is this one? This is the one I thought came up earlier. Yeah, well done, Ray. It was a blackbird. That's right. It's a male blackbird. For some reason, the lady blackbird's brown. But I think they'll both look beautiful, don't they? That's lovely. And the next one, the next one. What's the next bird that we've got here? I think we've got a couple more. Yeah, what? Do you know, we hadn't seen any of these in our garden for ages. So let's go for Martha. What is that one? It's a what? It's a blue bird. Well, it's got blue in it. But what's its actual name? You're right. It's very close to the name. A blue tip. That's right. Fantastic. <laughs> It's very pretty, isn't it? Not as pretty as you. Well, I'm not sure about that, but I know you are. You're very, very, very handsome. That's right. That's good. Okay. I think there's one more. Yes. How many of you know what this one is? I hope I got this one right. Otherwise, Neil, well, when he gets to see this, will tell me I'm wrong. What is this parrot? What's this bird? I'll give you a clue there. It must have been. But I don't know how uh, clue, clueless you are this morning. What particular bird is going to be Dylan again? I can see some of the back. Lily. It is a sparrow, I think. I hope. But they're very boring-looking birds. Well, well, it's interesting you say that because actually God talked something. Well, Jesus told us something about sparrows. When I'm out the front in the next few months, I'm going to do something all about different birds. And this one's about a sparrow. And Jesus said something about a sparrow. Can you put it up for me, James? Because he actually said some sparrows aren't worth very much. In the days where Jesus lived, they used to sell sparrows. And he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? 
So you can get two sparrows for a penny. I was trying to think how much <laughs> you can buy budgies. That's right. How many have ever bought a budgerigar? And how much does it cost nowadays? I can see Paul bought one in the past. Who bought a budgerigar recently? Anybody? Uh, well, I have no idea, but there are a lot more than two, one penny. But it says, no one will fall to the ground except apart from my father. Even the hairs of your hair are numbered. And Jesus wants us to realize that every single one of us, even though God loves the birds and he actually gives them food to eat. I'm not sure if he gives them chocolate-covered sunflower seeds, but he gives them lots of birds to put food to eat. But you know what also happens? He, is, he protects them, looks after them, and he knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. And you know, he's telling us that because he wants us to realize how important we are to him. Because he goes on to say, you are more valuable than sparrows. <laughs> Not my cause. I'm not sure about that one. We'll leave it on there. I think people are very valuable. You're valuable too, but Jesus wants us to remember how valuable we are. So next time you're in the garden and you see blackbirds and magpies and crows, just remember that God is teaching us a really important lesson. He knows every bird, but he also knows each one of you, and he even knows how many hairs on your head. How many hairs are on George's head? Maybe Ed has, or Helen has counted. He's got a lovely Mohican. <laughs> like yours, yeah, I can see that. That's like the Mohican. <laughs> Fantastic. So let's thank God together for that before the band come back and lead us in the next song. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day and this world that you've made for us to see and enjoy. For every bird that sings, every uh, flower that blooms, Lord Jesus, and for just the ability even to see them and hear them. Thank you. We appreciate that, particularly when some of us perhaps have began to lose the ability to hear and see. Thank you. That also for the senses of smell that you give us to, to enjoy this lovely season. Father, thank you, and help us, and help the children too as they go out to classes a little later. Help their teachers too, as they share your word with them, how you're a God that cares, a God that feeds and clothes us, and a God that knows every single one of us intimately. And we give you thanks again in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well done, Mac. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, we're going to sing a few songs now, so if um, you'd like to stand, uh, please feel free. We can sing Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. The whole world has the glory divine. The heir of salvation, purchase of
looking to you we, um, I pray that um, it really hits home this morning and that we yeah see something in you in you um, in your glorious name amen just before Ed we need to read the scriptures I'm reading from first Thessalonians chapter 2 starting verse 17 and through to the end of chapter 3 and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. 
But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavoured the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this, for when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labour would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith for now we live if you are standing fast in the lord for what thanksgiving can we return to god for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our god as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith now may our god and father himself and our lord jesus direct our way to you and may the lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our god and father at the coming of our lord jesus with all his saints amen thank you steve when I was doing my uh, training down in Moreland's College, down there in Dorset, um, one of our lecturers uh, often encouraged us, and uh, one morning he encouraged us by saying uh, to us that whenever we stand up to preach, be assured that the only guaranteed inspired part will be when the scriptures are read. <laughs> so um, thank you. Um, uh, Steve, for reading God's inspired word to us. Um, we're carrying on in our series in 1 Thessalonians. Today we are crossing over from chapter 2 into chapter 3. Um, but I have a question for you. When do you feel most alive? When do you feel most alive? Maybe it is that, that early morning moment when you've got your first coffee or tea of the day. You're sat outside. The air is still slightly damp. The birds are... Uh, are beginning to um, uh, wake up, the sun is just rising, you're beginning to feel the warmth of the sun. Maybe that's when you feel most alive. Maybe it is when you are surrounded by all of your family and your friends. Maybe that is what gives you life. Does anybody recognize this man? I'm looking to the older generation here. Anybody recognize him? I'll put the next picture up. Oh, next couple of pictures to give you a clue. Anybody know this gentleman it, uh, was called Tim Birkin. Uh, Tim uh, raced Bentleys on the Brooklyn's motor circuit back in, in the 1920s. Um, and he was quoted by saying, 30 seconds at full throttle is far better than a life behind the desk. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Um, for him, he felt most alive when he was behind that, that massive wheel, powering down th those uh, long straights, perfect gear changes, going out first in, in the race. That's when he felt most alive. When do you feel most alive? What gives you life? For Paul, we find it in this morning's passage. In the middle of 1 Thessalonians, we find his most alive moment. He says, because of you, now we really live. He felt most alive because of this church. But in order to know why he felt most alive, or what it was particularly about this church that really gave him life, we have to understand 
what, like, what else is going on? So thank you, Steve, for reading that passage to us, because context is key. As you know, we love maps. Maps are very um, uh, helpful, very uh, important. Um, I don't have any uh, surprise circles appearing this morning around Antioch. You'll be pleased to know. Um, but way over there in the top left corner, we have Thessalonica and Berea, which is um, where we are uh, first introduced to the church in uh, Thessalonians. Um, or the Thessalonians, um, and th- but then zooming in ever so slightly, um, our letter that we're studying at, at the moment was written by Paul w- um, once he had run away or effectively been chased out of uh, Thessalonica um, down there in Corinth. So that's where he is writing from, um, but he had only spent three weeks, we believe, in Thessalonica and planted this, this church was then effectively chased out of, of, of the town and missed this church so much, was so desperate to find out how they were doing. He sent Timothy, because there was Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They sent Timothy, who was an encourager and evangelist, back up to Thessalonica to strengthen and encourage the church there. And then Timothy comes back with a report, and it's good news, um, and then that is when Paul sits down and writes his letter, First Thessalonians. Obviously, it wasn't called First Thessalonians then. It was just called, well, it was just a letter. Um, but this passage that we've looked at this morning, really, it's mainly background and context. I preached on this uh, exact same uh, passage a few months ago um, with um, uh, uh, our friends down in uh, Castleton Chapel, down in Mumbles, I believe Zach's with them this morning, actually. Um, and really, revisiting it, it's, it's all context. It's just telling the story. Paul saying, we missed you, so I sent Timothy to find out how you're doing. And he's come back and said that you're doing well, which has encouraged me. Keep going. Um, so as a preacher, you think, mm, what do I tease out of this? As a Bible teacher, you think, brilliant, that there's so much context, we, we can get maps and um, do all sorts of things. But as I've sat with this passage over the last couple of weeks, God has really um, uh, spoken to me about faith and the faith that Paul had, the faith, uh, the faith that the Thessalonians had, um, and hopefully it will be an encouragement to us in our faith this morning as well. Um, Really, it can be broken down into three parts. The heart, so Paul's heart for uh, for the church there. The encouragement, this mutual encouraging between the church there and Paul. Um, And also Paul's prayer for the church to keep on going. So the heart, the encouragement, and the prayer. But let's just uh, focus in ever so slightly on Paul's heart for this um, uh, uh, this. Uh, church. Seven times in only 14 verses does Paul tell this church how he feels about them. And I've put them there. V- um, uh, at 2 verse 17, our intense longing to see you. Our intense longing to see you. Verse 18, for we wanted to come to you. 3 verse 1, when we could stand it no longer. 3 verse 5 gets a little bit more personal and says, when I could stand it no longer. Verse 6, we also long to see you. Verse 10, night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again. And verse 11, he tells them what, what that prayer is. May God clear the way for us to come to you. Here is a man in Paul who really wants to be with this small young church. He really wants to be with them. He longs to be back with them to find out just how their faith is doing and how they're doing spiritually. Remember a couple of uh, weeks ago when uh, Mark was speaking to us, he, he brought that beautiful picture that Paul saw himself as a spiritual father and mother to this young church. Imagine being torn away from your child all, all you want is to get back to be near your child, even at 3 a.m. when they're screaming. <laughs> you want to be back where y- your, your child is. Paul longed to be back with him, um, with, with that church there. And 
that longing resulted in Paul sending Timothy back to this church, a church which he's already referred to as his joy and his crown. Imagine that. Imagine someone speaking about us as their joy and their crown. It's roughly a a week's walk to get from Corinth back up to uh, Thessalonica. So Paul uh, sends uh, Timothy back up there to supply what is lacking in their faith. The NIV says uh, to strengthen and encourage or to supply what is lacking in their faith. The Greek, which the ESV, I notice as Steve read, is translated better in the ESV, so it's always good to read other um, uh, versions. Um, The Greek word means to establish. Paul sent Timothy back to establish their faith. We don't know what Timothy said to them. We don't know how long Timothy spent with them. Um, But we know that the report that came back with Timothy, once he traveled back down to Corinth, it was a good report. In fact, it was a really good report. Rather than their faith dwindling and getting worse because of the little that they knew in those three weeks when Paul had been there teaching them, he came back with good news, that their faith was doing well. Verse 7 of uh, chapter 3, Paul says, in all of our distress and persecution, we were encouraged. Encouraged why? Well, we're encouraged about you because of your faith. Paul was encouraged by because of their faith. Now, what is faith? Before I put the next slide up, faith is being sure of what we hope for and Certain of what we do not see. Thank you. Have confidence in your scriptural knowledge, friends. Uh, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In war films, it is depicted in that moment when a comrade is out there lying on, um, uh, uh, um, uh, on the field Uh, needing to be picked up by someone. And and through the mist and the smoke and the shrapnel and the explosions going off, one of their comrades comes back and picks them up. And you hear those words, I knew you would come. They had faith that they would come. They were sure that their friend would come back for them because of the camaraderie camaraderie in, in their platoon. He was certain that he was going to come back for him because of the training that they have. My auntie down there in uh, Cape Town, she has faith at the moment that we as a church are praying for her. She's never been to one of our early morning prayer meetings. Well, it's not actually that early at nine o'clock, but but she's never been to one of our prayer meetings. She's never sat with you in your home when you're having your own prayer time, but she has faith that we as a church are praying for her at the moment as she goes through her um, uh, cancer treatment because I've told her that, that we are praying. She is sure that we are praying because I've told her, and she's certain of it, hopefully, because of my credibility in telling her that. She's sure and she's certain. Our faith in Jesus, that he is the Son of God, our faith in the resurrection, our faith in the second coming, it stretches further than those examples because our faith goes beyond time. It goes beyond space. It even goes beyond matter because none of us have ever been to eternity. None of us, I'm pretty sure, um, uh, have actually seen Jesus face to face. But our faith We are sure of him, and we are certain of him. We've never been there. I I don't know anyone who's ever been there or or ever seen him face to face, but I do know the one who has come from there. I know that people have written their accounts of seeing him face to face. The entirety of my faith and of your faith is based on the words of Jesus and his credibility as a person. I am sure of what I hope for in Christ through reading the descriptions of him and his promises in 
Scripture. And I'm certain of what I do not see based on the words of Jesus and his credibility. He rose again. People saw it. He is a trustworthy source. My faith is founded in the trustworthiness of Jesus. My grandfather, I've left it in my bag, but don't worry, I had a dessert spoon. Because my grandfather used to illustrate faith with a dessert spoon. Faith is being sure of what you hope for. You hope that that dessert is coming. You're certain that that dessert is coming because there is a a dessert spoon there. When I was younger, I always asked my mum, should I put spoons out when I laid the table? Oh, me of little faith. I was sure that there was going to be dessert based on every other evening meal we had ever had. There was always a pudding in our house. There still is, isn't there? And I was certain, even, even if I doubted what had gone before, I was certain that there was going to be pudding that day because my parents love pudding. So there was always going to be pudding. I should have known, based on my own lived experience, that we always had pudding. By placing a spoon there without asking mum if we were going to have pudding would have been me declaring my faith, declaring my faith that pudding was coming. We're encouraged in Scripture to have faith as small as a mustard seed. I encourage you to have faith in the shape of a dessert spoon. What shape and what size is your faith this morning? Do you have faith for pudding? Do you have faith that people are praying for you and that, and, and that you will survive that cancer? Do you have faith that you will inherit that eternal life? Do you have faith that you are forgiven? Do you have faith that Jesus really is who he says that he is? In Paul's case, he had faith in this little church in Thessalonica. How is your faith this morning? How is your faith this morning? But faith isn't only in the um, uh, for, for the the end goal or for the uh, completion. Faith is for the here and now also. The hope of tomorrow helps us through today. We can hold out a little bit longer if we know that help is coming. The sirens of an ambulance is that, is that sign of hope that help is on its way. It builds that faith in us. Seeing a dessert spoon at the top of your plate gives you that perseverance through your plate of broccoli and mushrooms and all of those horrible things. It gives us faith to persevere, to carry on going. Our faith in what is to come helps us through the here and now. Paul speaks about the, the persecution and, and those, those trials that the church were going to be experiencing. Their faith in what was to come helped them through the here and now. The promise of salvation and eternity for us, based on Jesus' words and his own example of life beyond the grave, it puts into, whoa, it puts into perspective the life and the trials that we face in this life, and it makes it all bearable. Paul faced these trials, he says there in verse 7 of chapter 3, the Thessalonians faced them as well in verse 3. But what if you're not feeling it at the moment? What if your faith feels smaller than a mustard seed or minus matter? We all have moments where our faith can be tried or put on test, times when we feel quite dry in our faith or struggling in our relationship with Jesus. We can be worrying about things in life and yet we we know from scripture that we're told do not worry. Jesus tells us do not worry. It says 365 times in various ways do not worry in scripture. So there's one there for every day. Many of us are experiencing little faith at the moment or lack of faith at the moment. But note here, 
Paul's moment of little faith. I'm really encouraged by this. Paul has a moment of little faith. Jesus uh, scolds his uh, disciples and says, Oh, you of little faith in Matthew 8. But here, Paul, the mighty Paul, that great theologian Paul, who surely knew everything that there is to know about Jesus, has this moment of little faith. 3 verse 5. He, he has this moment where he is worried about this little church up there in Thessalonica. He says, I sent Timothy to learn about your faith because of the fear that he had that somehow the tempter, who's the, the devil, Satan, had tempted you and our labors would be in vain. This is a moment where Paul has little faith. He's worried that the enemy would have tempted that church away from following Jesus. He's forgotten the power of the Spirit, and he has taken his eyes off of Jesus for this moment. And as soon as we take our eyes or our mind or our heart off Jesus for just a moment, and we stop trusting him, then that allows doubt to enter into our hearts, into our minds. Perfect example of Peter. Peter got out of that boat. What great faith he had in Jesus there. When Jesus said, get out of the, the boat and walk towards me. Peter had enough faith to get out of that boat. As soon as he looked around, he started sinking. Fred encouraged us at the beginning of this year to fix our eyes on Jesus. Here, Paul allowed his mind to focus on the humanity of the Thessalonians and to put his trust, his faith, in their ability or lack of ability as, as humans to follow Jesus in the face of the opposition rather than trusting in the God that gives faith, trusting that, that the Holy Spirit in them would be working to bless them and keep them. Paul was worried about them, and I guess rightly so, as that spiritual father and mother figure that he was to them. But friends, our faith is not dependent on, um, uh, on our ability to stay close to God. Our faith isn't dependent on your ability. Our faith isn't even dependent on, on those external factors on these persecutions, on, on these trials, on these struggles, on these dry times that we have. Our faith isn't based on those things. No, our faith is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God. John chapter 6, verse 29 says, And the work of God is this, believe in the one he has sent. Ephesians 2, 8, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. In fact, it is the gift of God. Sorry. For it is by grace that we have been saved. Through faith. And this faith is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God. Our faith is given to us by God. Our faith on him is dependent on him. Or our faith in him is dependent on him. So how did these, uh, these uh, Thessalonians stand up under these trials? Well, it was by the faith that God was giving to them. It was, it was the ability that God had already given them. Paul was worried about them because they'd only been believers in Jesus for a few short weeks. They didn't really know a huge amount of, of stuff yet. That doesn't matter because faith is a gift from God. It is God that holds us, not our knowledge of him. That helps, of course, but it's God that holds us. It's God that holds us. We can do all things through him who gives us strength, not because of your fallible, finite, failing abilities, but wholly and solely because of God's unending, unshrinking faithfulness to you. That's good news this morning. That takes the pressure off a little bit, doesn't it? We are kept close to God by God. <laughs> See how, how Paul's faith was small here. 
He had forgotten God's ability and had focused on his idea of the Thessalonians' ability to stay close to God. But God is faithful, we are not. But his spirit in us can make us faith-filled. So, how do we grow in our faith? Well, this is a great example in this letter here of mutual encouragement. Paul to the Thessalonians and the and the report from the Thessalonians back to Paul, and then he sits down and writes his letter back to them by simply sharing examples of and stories of what God is doing in your life. The the best way of building faith or encouragement in a in in a Christian brother or sister is to share stories of what God is doing. Because they are true stories. They, they are real stories. Uh, Paul was worried about them, but, but when he heard about how strong their faith was continuing to be, he was courage, encouraged in his own faith. And therefore, his experience of God through hearing that good news from them and his knowledge of God grew. It grew in that moment as he learned that God keeps new believers close to himself. Phil and I were speaking um, uh, just before the service about how like, it's moments like this that would have been building Paul's theology, Paul's understanding of who God is. Because Paul himself hadn't been a Christian that long when he wrote this letter. It's only a few years, really, after Jesus' life on earth. Paul is writing this. So his understanding of who Jesus is of how God works as Trinity, was building as he wrote this. So he was encouraged, and then he returns that favor by writing to this amazing uh, new young church this letter of encouragement and teaching, but of encouragement to help them grow in their faith as well. So who is encouraging you? Who are you meeting up with? to help establish greater faith in you and to help you establish greater faith in them. Paul, um, as in our own Paul, Thomas, um, uh, um, uh, brought an amazing challenge to us uh, sometime last year when he introduced our 3-2-1 groups saying your discipleship is your responsibility. No one is going to grow you closer to God on your behalf. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. Therefore, individually, it's our responsibility to meet with people, to encourage them, and and to be encouraged back by them. So we have, obviously, our Sunday morning gatherings. It's a great place to come to be encouraged, but midweek, we have life groups happening all around the local area. We have three to one groups, which is three people meeting for two hours once a month, and just a chance to, to, to gather, to share, to pray, to be encouraged in our faith. But also, because faith is a gift from God, if you are feeling this morning that you are lacking in your faith, or you want your faith to grow, basically, you want more, more faith, ask God for it, because he has it, and he wants to give it to you. He is a good father who wants to give good gifts to his children. That's us. Ask him, and it will please him to give it to you. Ask him, Lord, guide me, lead me, show me where I should be going. I can't remember um, whether it was during Phil's message last Sunday morning or just through a, a conversation in in the week, but, but um, I was um, uh, uh, well encouraged and challenged by Phil that, that we shouldn't be asking God to walk with us in our days, but we should be asking God, how can I be walking with you in this day? Ask God these kinds of questions. Seek him and you will find him. I love that promise. God has promised us, if you seek me, you will find me. God isn't hard to find. He isn't hiding behind some, some rock waiting to be found. He, he says, seek me and you will find me. I'm here. I'm here. 
So Paul says, in response to the good report of their faith, that they were doing well, he says, for now we really live. If you want to really live, then sharing uh, your faith with people, being encouraged by other people's faith stories, doing life together, life groups, church, three, two, ones, that's how we really live. Shoulder to shoulder, together we go. And then Paul goes on and he um, uh, 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 prays for them in uh, 3 verse uh, 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 11 to 13. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones, with all of his saints. Guys, there is no completion to your faith. People often, um, uh, when they um, uh, start to think about being baptised, often think, I don't think I'm ready yet. Well, will you ever be ready? Are we ever ready to see Jesus face to face? Are we ever ready to step out in faith? There is no completion to our faith until the day our earthly bodies finish. (laughs) And even then, there's going to be so much more to learn and discover. There's no completion in our relationship with God. There's always more to learn. There's always new depths to discover, new disciplines to explore. And Paul wants this church to keep on learning, um, to, to... to keep on growing in these different areas. That's what discipleship is. I'm sure the older members of our congregation will will testify to the amount that they know that they don't yet know. There is still more to learn. It's discipleship. That's why we keep on gathering week after week after week after week. It's why we have life groups every week. It's why we have prayer meetings every week. It's why we have our men's walk and our ladies' coffee afternoons and making things. It's discipleship. It's doing life together. And by doing life together, that is how we as Christians really live. It's how we really live. And that is Paul's prayer for this young church in Thessalonica. And it's our prayer too, isn't it, for us here as church. I hope it's your prayer for each other as well. Every day is an opportunity to deepen your faith and to carry on in your relationship with God. Every day is a day for discipleship. So, to get a little bit uh, uh, um, uh, practical now, if you don't yet have someone or some people that you meet with regularly to establish your faith and for you to help establish their faith, come and have a chat afterwards. We would love to link you up into a 321 group or help you find one of our life groups or just a friend in, in the church that you can regularly meet with to be encouraged in your faith. It's very hard to be a Christian on your own. It's like a lump of coal can be taken out of a, a fire. It, 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 it will stay warm for a short time, but it will get cool and it will go cold. But put that back in the fire and it will start to warm up because of all of the other coals around it. And, and, and it itself, by warming up, will help keep all of the, the other lumps of coal warm as well. Have at least one person around you who is going to strengthen your faith and encourage your faith. Find a life group. Make a 3 two, one group. So how do you really live? Or when do you feel most alive? And unfortunately for Tim Birkin, cars rust. They break down. They get scrapped. Mornings warm up and they get busy and that moment of tranquility is gone. Family goes home to their own homes. Holidays finish. Classical music comes to an end. Whatever it is that, that makes you feel most alive, it will probably have an end point unless what makes you feel really alive 
is spending time with one another as, as believers, is being encouraged in your faith and encouraging other people in their faith. It doesn't have to be big and fun and showy and flashy, but just simple, just meeting together, sharing life, praying, encouraging each other in our faith. Because God lasts, and eternity goes on forever. So let us invest in what really makes us live. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you are that one thing that lasts. You are eternal. You are life itself. And Lord, it is only by having your spirit in us that we can really live. Thank you, uh, God, Father, Son, and, and Spirit, that, that, that it is your delight to give us that gift of faith. Lord, personally, thank you for giving me that gift of faith. Thank you for each one of us here this morning, Lord, who you have given that faith to. Faith as small as a mustard seed or faith even smaller than a mustard seed. Lord, you have given us faith. Lord, help us to invest wisely in our faith so that we may grow in our faith, so that our faith may be established more and more through our life. And Lord, help us to uh, be an encouragement to our brothers and sisters to help establish their faith also. Lord, we, we thank you for who you are. We are blown away by who you are. We are humbled by who you are. And Lord, thank you that you want to know us and that you've called us into your family. We thank you, Lord. Amen.
respond together in communion, uh, taking bread and wine as an act of faith, isn't it? That's what Ed has been sharing with us. We're going to take some bread, okay, some free bread, and take some juice. And this is an act of faith. It's a declaration, too, of what Jesus has done. We proclaim his death until he comes. But it's that moment of faith and trusting that what Jesus said 2,000 years ago when he first did it, taking what was an ancient feast and make it fresh and new in a new covenant, a new agreement, that it actually is for us today. Just by eating bread and, and juice isn't going to make our faith grow, but it's actually trusting that what he has done has accomplished is going to strengthen our hearts and our minds in him. Let me just pray. And then uh, I'm going to just serve these guys here first. And, uh, and then we're going to take communion together. Lord, we've listened to your word together. It's a word that stirs us because we know where our hearts are. Every one of us. And yet if your servant Paul could also fear and wonder and question and be anxious. He knows where we've been too. And so, Lord, in these moments, as we, together, in this space, your children, seeking to shout out your praise, um, Father, we choose to leave it all behind. Our sinfulness, our wandering, our brokenness, our uncertainty, we choose to leave it all behind. And we know that you're holding on to us as we reach out to you again in faith. And we take this that your son gave us so that, Lord, our faith may be lifted and strengthened together as we share in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pass the bread and then uh, when we come to the juice, we'll hold it and we'll take it together and uh, we will sing a song in between that, uh, which will lift our hearts as well. Everybody else will stay seated for that song. But uh, Jesus said on the night he was betrayed... I haven't got a microphone, but I'll... He took bread and said, this is my body, which was given for you. We often say broken. He was broken, wasn't it? But he was given for you. He took the cup, saying this is a new covenant, a new agreement, a new testimony, and that's something you can be trustworthy, certain about, in my blood. I pay for it for my life so that you would know that your sins are forgiven and that you have a Father in heaven that loves you. That's what it really entitles us to, isn't it? And he said, I give you this that you will remember because he knows we forget. Let's take it together now.
that sense of sharing together isn't it you can break bread on your own I've done it on one or two occasions just felt that would be needed at that moment just to stop and remember that it's that corporateness of broken uh, struggling disciples of Jesus victorious in what he has done we take time to stop and remember so let's just take this cup as he asked us to do in faith trusting and believing not only he's done in the past and not only what has come in the future but right now our present faith that it may be strengthened because of what we've just sung about he took my blame he took my pain he took my sin and he established this covenant let's take this cup stand together sure, as we sing this final song that reminds us of the power of the name of Jesus
What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you pray this prayer over us that Paul prays for these new believers. Now may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. 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 Thank you. Let's take our seats just for a moment. I just wanted to add two short, quick things. Just to encourage you that um, we, on a Wednesday, when we have these times together, there'll be an opportunity for you to share. So come, wanting to share. Uh, It says in Scripture that they broke bread from house to house day by day. Uh, so we'll also break bread as well. Uh, so if you want to come and break bread with us, uh, or just want to share what God has put in your heart, something that Ed has said, I already got something burning in my heart, that just one line actually that I want to share on, 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 on uh, Wednesday. So please join us. Our life groups will start back the following week, but that's a midweek time, 7 for 7.30 purposely, so we will start at 7.30 and we'll finish by quarter to 9.00. So if those of you need to get back, then please do remember that as well. Uh, two other things. One is just to say, I just had a text. I was sitting out there because um, I, I, I thought I won't disturb you, come back in. I was sitting watching on two things, watching it live and watching on here because I'd forgotten you can comment. And uh, there was a little comment from someone watching. 
uh, a man called Isaiah Debru. And uh, Isaiah commented and uh, said, congratulations to Reese and to uh, Maria and the family. And uh, so I commented back, and he's just texted me to say this. Phil, we plan to be in Swansea for Monday, the 10th of July, and stay for two weeks. We're excited to see you all. We've been longing for this for quite a long time. Now, Isaias uh, came to us as a refugee, an asylum seeker from Eritrea, was with us for, I don't know how many years, seven, eight years, and uh, married, and, uh, and now uh, he and Habana have been living with her two, three, two. I'm getting confused now. Two. Two girls uh, in, in, in Norway, and so they're going to come and join us. And that's lovely, isn't it, just to have that link again so they'll be with us for two weeks in July. And the last thing to say is this. As you pack down, there's a, a new order, and the new order is this. There is always going to be someone in charge, and I put myself in charge this week, not because I want to be in charge, but because so the person in charge will be coordinated at the container. They'll be there. And so if you're heading out to your car and you think, well, I can carry a music stand or something like that, please help us and bring it to me at the container. Someone's going to bring me a coffee. That would be lovely. And, uh, and then we, we'll pack. But that's not until about 25 to, folks, all right? So another 20 minutes or so or whatever, just uh, spend some time just get, catching up with one another. And uh, thank you again to Ed and to Becky for leading us and all those in the background helping to uh, make this such a lovely morning uh, together. Thank you. God bless. Oh, I did forget to say one other thing. If any of you are free this evening, Tracy Boland is getting baptized down at the International Church down in, uh, in Swansea, in York Place. I can't remember the time, but Emma will tell you the time. And if you want to... Half past four. There we are. Thanks, Sue. Uh, that's great. So if any of you want to go and let's watch Tracy getting baptized, then that will be great. <laughs>